Okay, is this on? All right, yeah. All right so <clears throat> I'll try to be uh, a little bit briefer, perhaps. Such a change in title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so the, my first, so the, let me say, so um, this, the experiment, I have some experimental results in this, some close collaborations with a group in Paris and in Japan. But as Dan said, I'm also beginning to do a little collaborative work. I spent some time at Berkeley and, and enjoying a collaboration with uh, the LBL group. Okay, so the, the change in title um, basically comes from the fact that there are very few experimental electron molecular ion differential cross sections or total cross sections. Maybe H2 plus. That's about it. There aren't very many. So one way of getting at the electron molecular ion scattering is looking at molecular photoionization. It's the same electronic wave function, um, uh, and there are lots of experiments with photoionization. So we've looked at mostly it is molecular photoionization. Okay, and so what we're looking at in, in terms of molecular photoionization are total cross sections, um, orientation average asymmetry parameters, and with some recent experiments, um, some molecular frame angular distribution. So in the frame of the molecule where the photoelectron gets sent. Um, again, we're, uh, we do everything within an adiabatic nuclei approximation, so you can do the calculation of fixed nuclei, and then I'll have a few results looking at some small amplitude motion where you're just averaging over the vibrational states. And so the approach, is, uh, the approach I'm going to be talking about is basically where we assume there's only one electron in the continuum. So we represent the continuum electron differently from the target electrons. <coughs> okay, and so the approaches I'm going to talk about are based on using single center expansion. So basically you um, you write all, you, you do the continuum part in any case on a grid, uh, angular times spher spherical harmonic type grid. Um, so the continuum part is on the numerical grid, um, but I take the bound orbitals that are describe the, the target of, in these systems um, from a quantum chemistry code, typically MOLPRO, which is also a very good set. Um, and so I, I've done, we've done, done some linear molecules at fairly high level, and then some po non-linear polyatomics. Okay, and so how much correlation you put in the, the target wave function, so you could do a simple um, Hartree-Fock, that'd be like the static exchange, um, um, but going beyond that, we use um, modest CI expansions representing the target, something up to 10,000 CSFs. This is actually, more, this link is more or less based on the fact that the code we're using there, um, you know, has to diagonalize, does a, a, you know, a typical, you know, law pack diagonalization. I don't do an iterative di diagonalizer for this, so you, you run out of steam around 10,000 CSFs, so you have to diagonalize the state. Inside my code, um, there, there's this just diagonalization. I never, but this you can do quite a bit at this level without having to go do an iterative diagonalization. Um, okay, and so we use a, a, a couple channel type expansion, and, um, and I'll m mention a little bit about then how we deal with the penetration terms. But even the couple channel expansions typically don't go up to more than 20 channels, electronic channels. Okay, the, the numerical codes that I, um, I've been using are based on the Schrodinger variational method, uh, but this is a very simple couple channel representation of that. So basically all we need to do is calculate matrix elements um, with the potential and the Green's function, and instead of and the, the code that um, Vince and, and Brazilian groups use, they uh, expand the screens function using plane wave expansions and do the integrals, but we use, um, since we're using a single center expansion, we can represent the Coulomb or the free part of the Green's function um, just in the, in the partial wave expansion and do those integrals in that, that fashion. Um, so this would be the variational expression for some observable in photoionization, you have a dipole excitation, and then you expand your trial functions in the basis set and you can calculate the matrix elements. And then we have various ways of iteratively uh, improving the basis set to, to get a better answer by, by um, augmenting the basis set at, at different, different iteration levels. Okay. Um, so um, we expand our, our target wave functions in the 
CSFs, and then we form the uh, the scattered away function um, with um, the uh, by taking the, the CSFs and multiplying um, them by uh, a scattered scattering function. Okay. Um, so penetration terms are defined as when the scattering wave function for the continuum electron looks like one of the or one of the basis functions or orbitals used to describe the bound state of the problem. And so, so there is some, in general, you think there'd be non-orthogonality between the continuum and the bound orbitals. And so one thing you have to worry about then is the fact that a direct product expansion like this is overcomplete because of the Pauli exclusion principle. You can't you can't put an electron in an orbital, which is already doubly occupied here. And so one consequence of that overcompleteness is that if you're not careful, you end up with spurious resonances, which is different in a sense than the ones that in, in the, the, the polarization calculation, but, uh, but it come basically coming from the overcompleteness of this direct product. And so the way, that, the way we remove that, um, avoid the, the spurious resonances in this case, is by the very schemes for um, selectively removing the penetration terms which don't have open channels associated with them. So uh, that's, that can be fairly easily done. Okay, so single center expansion, literally you just take every three dimensional function, write it down as a product of a radial function times spheric harmonics or, or, or symmetry adapted harmonics. And so the partial wave expansions for example, like N2, you might want to go up to L equals 60, and for CO2, maybe 80, and for bigger molecules, 100, 150, something of that nature. But since the, the arithmetic is pretty, I mean, it's fairly simple to, to code this, because everything is, is quite regular, and so it becomes more of a computer problem than a, a basis set problem, a computation problem. Um, uh, we use the fact, well, in the Schwinger method, we use the fact that such matrix elements are asymmetrical, and so you really only need to iterate in these iterative methods on the number of functions that you're trying to take expectation value of. So you, you can iterate this part and then multiply it by um, many of the, the different homogeneous scattering states. Okay. Okay, so one thing by going to numerical representation for a continuum function, in a sense, we can separate the basis set problem for the continuum from the basis set problem for the bound part of the state, bound part of the problem. Um, and so I, I would argue that if you, if you can do that, then you can actually separate in, in sort of this verification issue, you can include the one electron basis in that. I mean, like we sort of talked a little bit about, well, try different basis set. But the quantum chemists, you know, have developed these complete basis set extrapolation methods where in your in your uh, your one electron basis set, you can use a triple zeta, quadruple zeta, some whatever, however many zetas you can put in, and then use some sort of extrapolation technique to go to the infinite basis set limit. And by by separating the continuum part and basically solving that exactly, so that doesn't depend upon the continuum electron does not depend upon how big your basis set is you use to represent the bound orbitals. Then you can apply, although we actually haven't done this, but you can principally much easier to apply these extrapolation techniques to the one electron basis of that part in the bound part of the problem. Um, and it certainly you can converge uh, with respect to the radial density and the angular grids. Um, as I was saying, you could, you could apply, you could, in principle, you could apply some uh, basis of extrapolation techniques for the basis set on the bound part, part of the problem although there are always issues that certain things will, will converge at different rates. Um, and then obviously the rate of the grid depends on how, how, how high of kinetic energy you want to go to. One advantage of the sort of numerical way of representing the continuum is that, you know, if I want to do, L, you know, I can do scattering with the 500 EV kinetic energy electron, which takes a lot of partial waves, but okay, so I just crank up my L max a bit. So I can go up to L equal 20, 30, 40 in the exterior region of the problem, and those connect directly to the, uh, the scattering part. Okay, so this is from uh, ancient history, but just to show you why, you know, this partial wave single center expansion, at least for smallest systems, actually can work. So this is the photosation N2, 
whereas the ground state, and so what we're looking at is the position of this resonance. So the, the non-resonant part is not very sensitive to the partial wave expansion, but the position of the resonance is one of the things that can be fairly sensitive, but if you plot the position of that resonance in the photon energy, 28 volts or so, as a function of 1 over L cubed, it converges fairly quickly, not particularly quickly, but has a, a, a regular convergence, and so even at L equal 50 here, you're only you know, 0.05 eV away from where that resonance is. So for, for nitrogen, which is a fairly small molecule, um, you know, if you go to L equal 50, then your resonance positions may be you know, five, 0.05 of an eV off, where they would be if you could go to the infinite partial wave expansion. Okay, um, so how well does, you know, do these partial wave expansions work and all the other numeric? So what we, we've done is a few comparisons with results with the complex cone where, but since I'm, I'm running both calculations, it's pretty easy to get things to match up. And so in a, in a sort of a single channel calculation on SF6, okay, they're, they're pretty close. They're, maybe a 5% or 10% off. And here's a, a CO2, two-channel fertilization calculation. I use CAS SCF um, targets uh, and comparing the my uh, Schwinger, I don't have a label on it, one Schwinger calculation and one is the complex cone, and they come up pretty close. So in terms of just the, within a single model, I think we, we agree pretty well with, with what the complex cone would get. And so, again, low energy is actually probably more a problem with the complex cone in terms of the base limits they can use. Um, but uh, the agreement is pretty good. So with a given model, so given, you know, here's our, our, our target wave functions, I'm doing close coupling calculation, I, I think the um, these are all pretty well converged, 5 or 10 percent kind of conversions. Okay, so that would be, the, you know, given a, so given a model, how well can you do the, ca if the calculation? Then there's this question of validation. How close is that going to be to the physical, actual physical quantity you're interested in? Okay, so we can think about uh, how the calculation varies as a function of, of, of what you put in your model, whether you use fixed nuclei, you do the average of vibrational states, or different ch channel coupling expansions. Um, and so for photoionization, then we can compare the total cross-section. You can have the, the differential cross-section where you or, average over orientation. And because of these new experiments, you can actually look at the convergence of the molecular frame angular distributions. Uh, one interesting thing about uh, in um, photoionization is you have these different gauge. You can calculate the, uh, the matrix, uh, the cross-sections in. So you can actually look at the internal consistency, how close is length and velocity, which should have been the same if your wave function worked out. And then you can also look at convergence with respect to hierarchy of your, your calculations, channel couplings. Oh, I can never turn these off. Um, so here's this. Uh, so one comment is that um, because I'm talking about electron ion scattering, some of the problems that occur for the low, uh, low energy electron neutral scattering aren't important. Polarization is not that important. Okay. Um, and so this is a calculation looking at the sulfur 1S ionization, SF6, and the, the electron is, you know, this is all shifted up by the IP, but the electron still goes from 2500 to 2575, this is, you know, 70, 80, 100 EV kinetic energy. And there's this beautiful shape resonance which occurs at, up there at about 65 volts. Um, but this is a very simple calculation. It's just, just a, a frozen core Hartree Fock calculation. And you can get the positional resonance pretty well. Um, there's probably some issues having an SF6 is a high symmetry molecule that you have to consider asymmetric stretching that occurs in the ground state to, to broaden the, the resonances out. Um, turns out, I don't have the picture, but this the origin of the shape resonance is due to basically it's like an L equal nine angular momentum barrier. So these high this is a shape resonance at 65 volts, which you wouldn't normally expect to occur there, except for the fact that there's a big angular momentum barrier which can trap it. Okay, so for uh, photoionization, you can actually get pretty far with a very simple calculation. 
Okay, or, or if you want to do something big, how about C60? Mm -hmm. So this is a, a single center expansion calculation of C60. Well, that's sort of cheating because C60 is almost spherical anyway. But you can still get, there's still a lot of uh, structure that comes from the fact that, you know, the carbon isn't a smeared out charge that actually has structure. And so, um, so there's these three curves here are length, velocity, and the mixed form. And, you know, you can see there's some dip in the cross section, which also shows up in base symmetry parameter. Uh, this other dashed line here is, is a cone sham calculation of De Clave and Stenner back group. And their, their problem with the DFT calculations is that the treatment of exchange is not very good. They have to use some local exchange approximation. And some positions of resonances, which shows up here, when it should have been down here, uh, often are shifted by 4 or 5 EV, um, just based on the, on the density functional. And because this molecule has some symmetry, there are a lot of res a lot of these are all shape resonances. This is a one electron picture. There are a lot of resonances which occur, which, of course, experiment doesn't have the re resolution to even see them. Okay, so you can do big things. You know, if, especially if there's some symmetry. Okay, so that, those were single channel. How about couple channel? So we also do a, another simple level calculation is to um, is to represent your target still by Hartree Fock like targets, but then couple channels together. And so here's CO2. This is a total cross section. We're taking just ionization out of the valence orbitals, and, and these are all coupled together in the calculation. And so depending on how many channels you include, you can jump around a little bit, there's an Archie Fock. Um, the separate channel calculations in there. And so you can see there's there's some uncertainty down here. And this actually is, you'll see in a, a later example, this comes from the fact you're on one of these or two of these channels actually coming out of pi orbitals. And when you start picking hole making holes in pi orbitals, the correlation effects become very important and where that resonance actually is. Is, is more difficult to get right than compared to sigma holes. Now this bump out here, in part, um, hasn't really ever been explained why they never see an experiment. But some of it comes from the fact that, again, even in the ground state, there's some zero point bending motion. And because these resonances, this is a sigma star resonance, but if you bend it, you know, and you, you break the symmetry and the angle momentum barrier gets much diminished, and so um, averaging over um, some of these asymmetric stretches or bending modes will substantially reduce this. And so they, these are just fixed nuclei equilibrium geometry calculations. Okay, so that's CO2. Now what about SF6? Now here, there are three curves. There's the black line, which is the experiment. There's a total absorption looking at the valence ionization. And the uh, separated channel is the blue one. So these were done as individual static exchange calculations. And typically, the, well, if you look at the individual channels, um, the, the differences are quite a bit larger. But when you add everything together, uh, you can see that the, compared to the experiment, the, the resonances are much too narrow. Um, but now if you go do a couple calculation where you couple all these channels together, so although it looks like um, six channels, if you only use C2V or D2H symmetry, there's actually 17 channel calculation because each of these strictly degenerate states, you've got to put all the symmetries in. So there's 17 channel calculation. And it, it's somewhat better compared to the experiment, although, um, although this resonance up here, again, is still very prominent. Now this one uh, we've, we're continuing to work on, we believe, is best due to vibration. That when you break the symmetry, this resonance gets much flatter. Okay. But still, these are very simple calculations. They're Hartree Fock like ion states and um, just coupling the channels together. But again, but some of these differences, like here and here, are probably due to the neglect of the, you know, not averaging over the vibrational motion of the ground state. Okay, and so we, there are a couple of examples where, where we've actually tried to look at that. And so one is, is this uh, ionization, core ionization of CO2 and NO2. And what the experiment did actually was to, was to do the experiment at two different energies, uh, two different temperatures, and then taking the difference, they could look at what the effect of having an excited state of the, of the bending mode of these, of these molecules. 
And so these are the calculations. We look at the, the position of this resonance as a function of bending angle, and the pressure of this carbon 1s shifts down quite a bit as you bend it um, through 20-something uh, degrees, um, and then the, the peak. So these are all quite sensitive to this bending angle, at least the ones, especially the ones in CO2. And so if you do a calculation where you, where you average over, um, well, here would be the ground state, and this would be one, one quantum, the, the, the bending state. You can see there's some shift in the cross-section. And although the agreement's not spectacular, again, these are, are, are I think these are just simple cartridge flock by calculation. You can understand, at least qualitatively, um, with this sort of uh, level of agreement that this is coming from the sensitivity of the resonance to that bending mode, which is what's primarily excited. I forget, there's like 500 Kelvin or something um, state. So this is CO2, and O2. So you can, even within the simple adiabatic picture, you can begin to understand at least the sort of semi-quantitative using the calculation to um, try to get uh, you know, some understanding of the physics that's going on. I mean, these relatively simple calculations can give you some insight into what's going on. Okay, um, so this is uh, doing a, a more detailed calculation on CO, and so this included 13 uh, valence states in the close coupling, and so here we have the, the three outer valence uh, cross-sections, and so um, the line and the dots are pretty close on this one. Up here in the pi state, again, there's a problem Here's the experiment and the theory, and then the inner sigma state. And so the, this, um, the double sigma plus state, actually we can, we get quite good agreement with the experiment. Um, and then we tried to, the point of this calculation was to go to some intervalent states, which they then just dissociate photoionization on. And so we went up to some quite high, high, high levels for these correlated interstates. But unfortunately, there are no direct experiments for those cross sections. Okay, and then you can also look at the, at the symmetry parameter. The, and here the agreement's pretty good. Also, so the green line goes with the green boxes. Um, so you can, you know, obviously get asymmetry parameters. But the interesting thing was to look at this sort of internal soft consistency, looking at length, velocity, and the mixed form, which is geometric mean. And for the one where we get really good agreement with the experiment, all three of the forms are really the same. And so the uncertainty, we used to always claim this, that uh, the uncertainty of difference between length and velocity gives you a crude estimate, a sort of minimum error in some sense, uh, in your calculation. And in this case, we actually did a much better job converting, converging these calculations. It actually looked like this spread is actually a pretty good estimate, at least when you're away from these narrow resonances. Of the, uh, of the error in the calculation compared to, compared to the experiment. And likewise, over in this state, going to the pi state, where we had a, a fairly big difference between, for example, the mixed form and, and the measured cross-section, we also have a large spread in the length velocity. So the fact that the length and velocity were so far apart is a key a clue to the fact that this calculation probably wasn't that good that you really need to do a better job on the pi hole um, correlation to get these low energy cross sections better. Okay, so this, this internal consistency check uh, in photoionization is quite a useful uh, um, tool. Okay, so if you're doing total cross sections, ang angle average, well, the interesting thing is to say, well, you know, what we actually calculate are, are fixed molecular you know, cross section. The molecule here, the field here, the photo electron, where the heck's it go? Well, if you look at, so you, you think you could expand that um, intensity uh, cross section. You know, in a molecular frame, then you have some dependence on the, where the photo electron goes and some dependence on where the field is, and you'd have a very complicated function of these. Well, of course, the field part in the matrix element is just first, you know, it's like a cosine theta like term. So we go to the, the intensity to square of that. So you can expand the field part in the you know, simple polynomials up to, uh, up to cosine squared type terms, and also the feed dependence. So actually, even though it seems like a much more complicated object, 
you can describe the full molecular frame magnetic distribution using four one-dimensional functions that, that describe the dependence on the there are functions of the angle between the molecular axis and the photoelectron ejection. And the field part can all be factored out in these low order terms. Okay, so one the first molecule we looked at um, was uh, NO, and the way they do the experiments is they use a uh, coincidence measure. So you, uh, you photoionize to an ionic state, which then fragments. And if it fragments fast enough, then um, the recoil direction tells you the orientation of the molecule, and you do a, a coincidence measurement using pull trims or some sort of time of flight experiment, you can then get the molecular frame angle distribution. So, but for this experiment to work, you've got to start with the state that's dissociative. So the first state that's dissociative, NO, is the C triplet pi, which is quite a bit higher than many, many of these other ion states. So it, obviously it's going to take a fairly complicated calculation to, to get that right. Um, a simple calculation can be just five channels. It does a fairly good job getting the cross section and the asymmetry parameter, but it turned out to get a reasonable representation for the molecular frame angle distribution going to the C state, we needed to include quite a few channels. So if you do a one channel calculation, just have this one channel in, five channel was the one we had originally published like five years before, we got most of the cross section right, and then the final calculation we did which is fairly well converged, included all 17 channels, which included all, mo all the open channels and then some correlating channels that we could identify as be important in describing the correlated electron um, wave function. Okay, uh, so I don't have the experiment here, but this is the effect on the molecular frame angle distribution as you, as you add more channels. So the, the first column here is when the light is parallel to the molecular axis. And so adding, so going from here to here, basically done just the one channel you're interested in, and this has all the holes, the signal holes included in, in the uh, in the post coupling expansion. And so this, when you just put in the signal holes, it allows polarization along the axis, and that worked pretty well when the light was parallel. Uh, when the light's perpendicular to the micro axis, you're going from a sigma to a pi type transition, and without the pole. So adding the sigma holes didn't do much when the light's perpendicular, but when you add in the pi holes, then you can get this, this shape here. And this actually turned out to be quite close to the, to the um, uh, what's seen experimentally. And so if you go back to these four functions, which are actually described as total molecular frame angle distribution, um, so here was the, the computed, and then the uh, dotted line was, if you include the apparatus function, the finite resolution and the time of flight and the interaction region, you can get quite fairly good agreement between um, the computer and the experiment. So the experiment certainly is analyzing things correctly, and for a system which isn't very big, and know, you can get pretty good agreement. One interesting thing um, is what, so that's all based on assuming that you ionize the molecule and then fragments rapidly before it has a chance, and for a diatomic, basically has a chance to, to rotate. If you go to polyatomics, there are other dynamics that can occur. But for a, a, the diatomic, then, basically you have to make the assumption that it fragments fast before any rotation can occur. Um, but you can also treat systems where there is a, a finite lifetime through the associative process, and in a good example is O2, and so you, you ionize the system, the electron leaves, it rotates, and then it fragments. So the apparent angle between the photoelectron and the recoil axis is not the same as the electron in the original molecular frame axis. So, but you can include, you can treat that, that by you know, putting in the rotational dynamics and the rotational wave packet and the right temperature, and you can model then how what the apparent molecular frame angle distribution, or you, I call it the recoil frame angle distribution, how that compares to what you get in your calculation. So the system where we've done that, we're, we've done a two systems, one interesting case is O2, and so O2 you're, you're going to this B double sigma minus state, and it's pre-dissociative, takes about half a picosecond, and it ends up on this asymptote down here. Okay, so here again we can look at um, different levels of calculation, single channel, Hartree-Fock, 
there's an experiment done here, it's much too narrow, and the resonance, there's a low energy resonance which seems to be too low. Um, two channels is, I don't know, where is my, here, maybe this one here, seven channels, and the black line is ten channels. So it converges fairly well in the total cross section um, to the experimental cross sections. As you, as you add channels. And then here is the, um, the computed, these f functions which describe the molecular frame angular distribution. If you don't assume there's any rotation, it's a solid line, or the dash line has a convolution with the instrument function. And so that certainly doesn't look very much like, or you can see where the experiment has gotten, but the amplitude of the oscillations in these functions is much larger. So if you put in this, this fact that it can rotate with a lifetime of about a half a picosecond, then you get actually quite quite good agreement between theory and experiment. So in this case, um, down to the, the level of the molecular frame angular distribution, you know, we're getting down to um, you know, down the sort of 10% level uh, agreement between theory and experiment, both in the total cross section and these very detailed angular distributions. Okay, so in terms of sort of this uh, you know, uncertainties in the calculations, so verification, I think you know, we can converge certainly to within five or probably even better than that in terms of grids. And it's, it's certainly possible that if we had, you know, we could also do converge things in terms of the one electron basis using these sort of quantum chemistry like extrapolation techniques. Um, so if you separate out the one electron part as, as you know, something you should be able to do exactly, then the uncertainties and validation part go into questions about the model. Well, you know, whether you're going to treat vibrations, how many um, channels you're going to couple. Um, so you certainly can get the level sort of in, in terms of the PRA uh, um, editorial. You know, what what are you trying to do with your theoretical calculation? Well, we have obviously made a living off semi-quantitative agreement that allows us to interpret the experiment. Okay, and for these molecular systems, um, I, there are very few examples where we, I think, we're, we actually can converge the calculations in any sense. You know, I mean, that CO, CO example is okay. I, that's that's pretty good for total cross sections. Um, the more differential the quantities you want to calculate, the higher the level of calculation. So in that NO example, five channels got the total cross section and the beta pretty well, but to get the molecular frame angular distribution, we have to do quite a bit larger calculation. Um, uh, so, and, I, and I think that away from narrow resonances, you can probably, uh, you know, for these, these smaller systems, you can probably get quantitative agreement. Um, the problem with narrow resonances, that if we hit like an auto ionization resonance, is that the whole model will break down in the sense that if the lifetime is, is, is short compared to or lifetime is long compared to vibrational period, then you really have to put a vibrational structure in because what looks like a single line in a fixed nuclei calculation now becomes a whole forest of lines if you have vibrational resolved, you know, Rydberg levels. If they live long enough to, you know, you can actually see the vibrational structure in the resonance state, which none of that is included in this fixed nuclei. Well, there are things you can do like the complex potential work with uh, associated electron attachment. There's equivalent things you can do for um, photo uh, one thing that that uh, you know was come up both in Dan's talk and in, in one of the, the articles in the in one of the um, sections of that draft document is how important. Which I don't know the answer to this. How important is it to have consistency between the electronic structure and what I was saying about here and the geometric structure? So. I, I, I was listening on a talk that one of Anna Rell's postdocs was giving, and they're trying to do um, this, uh, uh, recombination, electron and ion. And they were focusing on doing a high enough electronic structure calculation to get the vibrations right. It was a small molecule, right? N2, H plus, or something like this. But then they also then try to use that same electronic structure level to do the electron ion scattering. Is that important? Or, or can you, you know, lower like what Dan was saying, for one part of it we use a low level compared to a high level for a different part. You know, are those consistencies important? Are there examples 
where using a low level for the electron scattering part is going to get you in trouble compared to a higher level that you need to get the vibrational, the geometric or vibrational structure correctly. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. The case is taken under submission.